Hello and welcome back to this uh, 35th lecture on bio microelectromechanical systems. Let us do a quick preview of what we did in the previous lecture. Uh, we tried, uh, we started designing uh, of peristaltic micro pumps and uh, their flow rates uh, through um, an integral technique wherein we would take an area, a radial area and try to use the deflection of a thin membrane uh, and then try to integrate the whole deflection saying that what would be the amount of uh, volume change delta V because of this deflection. The deflection would be caused by some kind of an energy mechanism and thus uh, this volume change multiplied by the frequency for low frequencies would actually give you uh, the, the tentative flow rates for the particular micro pump. We also talked about different forms of micro pumps, especially the non-conventional types like uh, ferrofluidic types of pumps wherein there were two geometries. One was just a simple planner uh, mechanism where with an external magnet. Another was uh, a circular path of fluid flow uh, with two parallelly placed magnets where the magnets would flow with the, or move with respect to one another with one fixed and another moving. And it would drive the fluid inside out the pump as a plug. We, we talked about valveless rectification pumping systems uh, and osmotic membrane type of pumping mechanisms so on so forth. Uh, then we uh, kind of went into the fabrication processes and tried to look into basically silicon because silicon was uh, uh, essentially the primary MEMS material that was uh, brought from the you know that was translated from the silicon industry. Uh, you may recall that uh, MEMS processes were essentially fallout of the microelectronic processes which were generated by the semiconductor industry and uh, due to the integration density problems those processes were made obsolete. So MEMS kind of took it up. So silicon definitely was the most prominent material which could start with uh, building MEMS okay, and also bio MEMS. So we talked about crystalline silicon and uh, their characterization modes um, and various uh, uh, notations which would be representatives of the directions and the planes or the group of planes. And uh, then we talked about this, uh, this famous Okralki's method of growth of single crystalline silicon uh, which is normally used in the industry for producing wafers. Today we would be looking into another uh, aspect of silicon crystalline, single crystalline silicon formulation and that is essentially also known as the float zone method. As you can see here in this particular example or illustration, the float zone method is really different than the, the Zokralki's growth method and uh, essentially this is used for making crystals uh, which are lower in diameter or size than what Zokralki's can normally make. So the way you make it is essentially by taking a polycrystalline supply rod as you can see here in this figure and this rod is kind of pushed through this small orifice in this region and uh, while it is being pushed and immediately before it is being pushed it is superheated in this particular zone by using uh, either some kind of an RF coil which is around this region or using infrared radiations uh, to a great extent or using laser. For example, so the, all these all these heating modes are non-contact in nature, okay? And so, therefore, there is a tendency of uh, no thermal gradients to be caused within this mold, which would uh, be an important advantage of this method over the Zokralki's growth method, where the heating is done essentially through the sides of the crucible. Now, as uh, this is heated up, and this is essentially this outer is essentially a quartz tube, okay? That is what uh, the outer is. This this whole outer is made up of quartz and so you have this necked region through which the, uh, the liquid flows and uh, on the other side here you have a seed crystal. So this essentially this part here as you are seeing is the seed crystal okay? and uh, as you are actually dipping the crystal down all the way to here and you have the silicon melt going in, uh, you essentially take this away now with a certain velocity V1 while this other outer is rotating okay and so as you are feeding the liquid material through the necked region into this region the seed uh, grows the material around it and uh, in the same direction as the seed crystal and therefore uh, you have this wafer which comes out in this end totally uh, of the same type as the seed crystal were. The advantage in this method is that it is uh, uh, you know free of any thermal gradients which may happen due to the other form of heating in Zokralki. The number two is that uh, the material has a higher purity uh, of, of silicon because uh, few silica which is melted is essentially passing only through a quartz environment 
as opposed to the Zokralkis where uh, you can have and also there is no question of any um, the whole process is carried out in vacuum there is no question of any gas entrapments here because the melt essentially is formulated uh, in the back side or, or as a plug and this, this particular thing is the solid material which is a plug. So, there is no intrusion of gases really and it is more pure or, or it is a high purity crystal that you can obtain by using the float zone method. So, in a nutshell this method is used for extremely high purity silicon growth, uh, a rod of high purity crystalline polycrystalline material is held in a chuck while a metal coil driven by high power radio frequency signal is also slowly passed along its length. Alternately, uh, alternatively a focused e-beam can also be used to heat the rod or an RF frequency is used normally. The field set up by the RF power leads to eddy currents and joule heating and the material is melted away. To enhance the growth along the preferred crystal orientation, a seed crystal is injected into the top of the molten rod and in this technique a thin neck of 3 millimeter diameter and 20, 10 to 20 centimeter long is pulled and the pull rate and the temperatures lowered to shoulder the crystal out to a larger diameter thereby making a large diameter crystal of uh, at the other end. Okay. Argon gas of course is flown through the tube for maintaining the, the inertness and uh, the non-inclusion of oxygen or any other moiety into the crystal. So, this is another form of uh, making silicon uh, polycrystalline or single crystalline silicon from polycrystalline silica material uh, and uh, essentially this kind of piggybacks the other Zokralki's process whenever purity uh, is in question and high pure material is needed. Let us uh, now look into some of the specifications that such wafer outputs would have from uh, both the processes. Uh, so, essentially uh, the silicon bowl that is finally emanated from both the processes whether it is float zone or Zokralki's. Uh, is first characterized by its resistivity and crystal perfection. Okay. So, uh, there may be point effects which may alter the resistivity significantly. There may be dopants uh, which are introduced in the melt for getting uh, p type or n type material uh, generally. So, this is one first aspect that what is the resistivity of the crystal and uh, what is the level of perfection of the crystal. Are there many defects or are there lesser defects? So, then the seed and tail are cut off and the bowl is mechanically trimmed to proper diameter. Uh, so, essentially now this proper diameter uh, is the diameter of the wafer the, that, that is in question. Um, the diameter at this point really is slightly larger though than the final wafer diameter because you have to have some allowance for polishing uh, the sides. Uh, additional etching probably has to be done and then that is followed by chemical mechanical polishing. The wafers for uh, uh, for wafers less than 150 millimeters flats are, are ground the entire length of the bowl to denote the crystal orientation and the doping type and uh, so therefore there is of course there is a flat side on one end of the bowl which can denote what kind of uh, crystal orientation uh, the silicon crystal would have or what is the doping type uh, and basically uh, the largest flat called the primary um, is, is oriented. Uh, perpendicular to the 100 direction okay that is what you have to remember so any silicon crystal uh, is denoted by this flat the largest flat on the side which is perpendicular to the direction of the 100 crystal and this can be evaluated by lattice diffraction methods at the very beginning and this is a kind of industry standard that they put uh, for you to figure out what uh, the direction of a certain uh, what a certain direction would be uh, of a particular crystal if you know what is the perpendicular direction to the 100 direction or 100 plane. Okay. So, you can see here this is really the, the top view of such a wafer and you can see at this end particularly the flat is grounded which means that this is probably the plane which is perpendicular to the direction 100. Okay. So, the direction 100 really is perpendicular to this that is what essentially it means. And, uh, then also this can be used to depend, depend other de denote other uh, kind of uh, the, about the resistivity like for example, this is a 111 p type this is a 111 n type this is a 100 p type okay, this is a 100 n type so on so forth. So, there are different specifications which the silicon industry would give for denoting these wafers. Other important aspects here are uh, the full specs where it considers what is the cleanliness in particles per centimeter square what is the oxygen concentration, the carbon, 
the metal contaminants in the bulk in parts per billion. Uh, you know, you can also talk about growth in or, or grown in dislocations per centimeter square of the surface area of the wafer. You could talk about oxygen induced uh, stacking faults. Could uh, you could also uh, this is in the volume of course stacking is an effect in the volume. You could talk about diameter uh, in millimeters. You could talk about thickness in microns. Uh, the bow of the wafer, how much the bowing the bowing happens or the warping happens. Uh, the global flatness, which is uh, in micrometer, and then of course the cost. So these specifications are normally specified on the the characterization box associated with any new wafer which comes in. On the other hand, some of the other materials like glass uh, uh, normally consist of silicon oxide, uh, which is about 68 percent in soda lime, 81 percent in borosilicate. These are different forms of glasses, and 100 percent as you see in fused silica. So fused silica essentially is this, this is the cleanest form of glass that is available. Okay, and it has uh, this silicon oxide in combination with some other metal oxides. Okay, normally. Uh, so, it has uh, desirable properties like high mechanical strength, high electrical insulation, uh, uh, more optical transparency and high chemical resistance etcetera. And uh, uh, in, in case of photolithography and other kind of techniques, uh, there are some commercially available glasses which you could actually photo pattern. One of them available commercially is known as photurin. Uh, it can be photo patterned directly onto the substrates wherein it can be used uh, either as uh, channel material. Uh, where particularly you sandwich such a layer and photo pattern it and then cover it with another layer on the top and then thermally bond maybe. So, there are embedded channels this way that you could make within a wafer. So, glasses are mostly etched in buffer HF uh, solutions. Okay. So, this slide really gives you uh, some of the introductory processes to MEMS fabrication. Uh, so, really this is all about formation of structures uh, that could be used to form sensors and actuators okay. that is all about MEMS. Uh, one shot MEMS is essentially how small uh, structures can be fabricated and realized so that they can be used as sensors or as actuation mechanisms. Okay. And uh, these sensors really do some processing, uh, some transduction processing of one form of signal into another. So, the signal can either be non electrical or electrical, the, in non electrical signals are particularly like piezo based or vibration based signals. And, uh, then we uh, we also uh, know that most of the MEMS are used or, or made or realized by using conventional and new semiconductor manufacturing techniques uh, things like etching, deposition, lithography, oxidation, epitaxy so on so forth. Uh, you could also uh, talk about some other specific to MEMS processes deep RI is one of them where you actually build very high aspect ratio straight edged channels. Uh, you can talk about thick plating particularly electrochemical plating where a very thick uh, um, metal layer is deposited and etched characters uh, etched and characterized etcetera. And uh, really if you divide this whole uh, this uh, machining you can categorize them into bulk and surface micro machining. The bulk as you know is more related to the volume removal or the bulk removal of the material this right here is an illustration. So, this is the cross section of the silicon wafer. And you can use this particular red layer here as the masking or the masking layer and you can actually etch away a material underneath it using an etching solution homogeneously or isotropically or you could actually do a deep RI based etch where you can have very straight aspect ratio or geometry of this particular channel. Uh, you have opened a etch window at the top here in order to accomplish this and this is plasma driven process and we are going to cover details of what plasma is in this particular topic or section a few slides from now. This is another very interesting illustration you are talking about depositing a P plus layer here. So, this is P plus silicon in green and you have opened another etch window and then you etch the material uh, in the bulk manner outside. So, that you can realize this freestanding uh, membrane uh, like uh, like, a, like a flat beam. Okay. So, therefore, uh, these are really bulk uh, micro machining process where it is a sub subtractive method it is removed from the volume of the material. The surface on the other hand is an additive process. Okay. So, bulk essentially is subtractive and surface is additive. So, as you are seeing here in this particular process you can see you are growing pillars, posts. This is a very fine illustration here. So, this was a sacrificial material as I am showing on the red shadowed region and uh, after depositing a layer of polysilicon on the top of it you have removed this layer out because it is sacrificial you can dip it in acetone or something. So, you can formulate 
an embedded channel in the polysilicon layer and between this glass. Or whatever it is, you are building it on the surface of a wafer. The wafer really is not subtractively uh, etched out, it is additively built upon. So, that is what surface micro machining is all about. Okay. So, we talk about etching first. So, etching as you see is a process which is now illustrated here. So, you actually do introduce uh, a blue layer as you are seeing here of a photoresist material as you can see. So, this is the photoresist material and this is a positive photoresist. So, wherever there is an exposure to light, there is going to be a creation of a via or a capillary. Then you add a photo mask as you are seeing from this uh, region here made up of violet color. So, this is the photo mask okay. and then you are exposing this whole assembly to the UV by after uh, putting the photo mask directly over the photoresist. And uh, so, as you actually hit it with light and uh, then I'll later on develop it, it creates uh, two uh, vias here on the resist. So, the remaining portion is still the resist as you see in the blue and this portion showed by the two red arrows here are really the resist which are removed or the vias are created. So, therefore, whatever there was there on the photo pattern as you are seeing here as open areas, okay, these two areas which were open here have been translated uh, in turn in terms of these vias on the photoresist. So, therefore, light fell on them and it got debonded or uh, and, and it could be removed or etched away. So, therefore, uh, one more interesting factor is that you know it has exposed the underneath silicon surface here which was the base wafer uh, to etching action and the other portion is actually a sacrificial cover over the silicon surface. Now, you could use uh, some kind of a, uh, you know some kind of a, an acid maybe HF okay, or aqua regia or some of, of the etch to etch off this particular layer up to certain depth and then essentially remove the photoresist uh, over it. So, okay, so, this is the etching process. So, let us say in this case you are using one part of H2SO4, eight parts of H2O2 and 100 uh, parts of H2O okay, by volume and when you have etched away this, this particular layer which was earlier grey as you can see here. Now, it is this is the etched part. So, it is de denoted by this light green and so you are left with etched holes or vias uh, and then you can remove the photoresist away. So, that you know the original wafer can be turned with two etches on both ends. So, these are the relatively lower uh, etch depths as you can see here okay, on both sides. So, this can be uh, like kind of etched structures or features within the micron surface. So, this is how etching is done with a sacrificial layer of resist. So, let us talk about subtractive or bulk techniques first. So, the first uh, kind of bulk technique is also the wet etching process. As the name refers, uh, it is essentially a, a process uh, of removing solid materials by dipping it in a chemical solution which can violently react and create groups or move away groups uh, and thus etching is performed uh, in, in that manner. Okay. So, wet etching in microelectronics uh, is mostly isotropic. Uh, independent of uh, the crystalline orientation etcetera and is done with very simple methods which can homogeneously go on etching by using chemical reaction uh, the, the bottom of you know the silicon surface. So, wet etching in microelectronics again are isotropic and independent of crystalline orientation. So, but then there is a, a pot potential pitfall to this problem and that is basically under etching and I would just like to illustrate here how this effect comes in. Let us suppose you have a sacrificial layer here which is also like a masking or a protective layer and you are using etch solution to pass through this particular etch window into this particular silicon and it starts etching away. So, because it is a homogeneous etch process, the etching would be same in all directions and therefore, uh, the this part which is away from the window is also started uh, or also starts to get etched and therefore, uh, the overall etch shape is really much much more in size than the etch window. So, this is really known as the under etching effect. Let us actually see how it how it happens. So, this is actually the mask window again okay. and uh, you have this layer of material removed from under the mask window and this area essentially this particular area is also known as the under etch of this particular uh, feature or structure. Now, one thing which is important to be noted here is that if uh, suppose the etch solution is well stirred uh, as the etching continues the shape will be more spherical in nature as you can see here 
because then the homogeneity of the edge is maintained the solution is continuously recirculated across the edges of this particular uh, you know illustration as opposed to where it is not properly etched then of course there will be a preferential edge direction which is more in the side than in the bottom okay so because uh, uh, essentially uh, you know you can consider that uh, more area more area is uh, being exposed uh, to the etch process in the bottom due to which there is more amount of material dissolved from the bottom okay and there is a concentration gradient which is created as opposed to the sides probably where very less amount of material is uh, withdrawn from and that's because of the low etch rate in the linear direction so because of this reason as you see overall uh, sometimes after a while this this etch gets flatter because uh, this is diffusion limited process the one the material which is getting dissolved and coming out is of course creating a concentration and then this becomes slower and slower as it goes down as compared to the other sides where less material has to be removed and the concentration is probably lower and so therefore uh, the the h can actually go ahead uh, in uh, properly okay so another important uh, factor here is the type of materials and then what it is selective to and this has been il illustrated earlier also what you mean by h selectivity selectivity is essentially uh, the stopping process uh, to the particular you know uh, material so suppose in this case you have a silicon material and you have a SiO2 layer which is a masking layer or a, or a sacrificial masking layer so uh, you can say that uh, this particular HN, HF HNO3 CH3 COH means acetic acid uh, nitric acid and hydrofluoric acid in a certain ratio forms uh, uh, an H stop over the SiO2 which means that it is selective to this as opposed to a silicon material where it is not uh, really selective to okay uh, and so therefore it etches of a silicon but whenever it approaches a SiO2 the etch stops similarly for a potassium hydroxide it etches of a silicon with a, um, a selectivity towards the SiO2 so this table here really illustrates what are the materials over which the etchants are effective and what is the etch stop layer for those kind of materials now these are some of the wet subtractive etching techniques and this slide has been illustrated before I would just like to kind of uh, put it back again that high edge selectivity is the necessary characteristics for silicon micro machining this shows high edge selectivity where there is uh, very low amount of uh, you know uh, sub substrate damage as the edge approaches an edge stop layer so really it is a very proper highly highly um, you know edge stopping uh, layer uh, of a certain chemical but some chemicals do not oppose this kind of a some chemicals do not give this kind of a property and it poses a problem by etching off the sacrificial layer as you can see here and so therefore the the etch stop layer is really not one uniform and that creates problems over the whole aspect ratios feature sizes etc etc for this particular you know uh, technique so one has to choose the etch and, and the etch stop layer in a very uh, good faith so that uh, there is hardly any substrate damage which would take place as the edge propagates these are some of the common uh, etchants for isotropic wet etching in silicon as you can see here and what it is selective to I have just compiled the table that was illustrated before and uh, the second technique that I would like to point is called an isotropic wet etching essentially this is the technique wherein um, you know a certain hydroxide based chemical uh, process is used for etching of silicon so in this particular anisotropic etching process uh, the only difference that you have is that the etchant solution is a hydroxide based solution and therefore uh, the process is really based on an electron transfer redox reaction which happens with silicon of the particular hydroxide etchant so as it is limited uh, by a flow of electrons from the silicon structure the problem that uh, one would face in this case is that during as the etching propagates or etch, as the etching continues so as the etching continues uh, there are certain planes of silicon along which there may be a shortage of electron donation okay electrons are more firmly bound in those planes because of that there there are certain planes over which the etch rate is effectively the slowest and as the process propagates and you know ultimately the feature which is carved in the silicon is uh, totally based on uh, such directions where the etch rate is the slowest and the etching takes place the slowest so eventually the average feature which generates in a silicon because of this kind of uh, you know uh, situation is based on 
uh, uh, reflection of those planes where the electron transfer is the slowest. So, therefore, uh, the edges happen eventually in the 1 0 0 1 1 1 direction. We will be clearing this point in a little bit uh, later example uh, numerical example when we try to find out such edge planes uh, regarding this process. So, in a nutshell for a single crystalline material such as uh, silicon as you can see here uh, the, the edge rates of anisotropic wet etching uh, really depends on the crystal orientation. And in an anisotropic wet etching process uh, is essentially redox formulation uh, where hydroxides react with silicon in the following steps. So, you have in the first step uh, the silicon getting coupled with hydroxide which is generated from the etchant material. So, 2 OH and this gives SiOH 2 with the 2 plus and 4 electrons here uh, and then this 4 electrons combined with uh, the, the water which is present around which dissolves the KOH or whatever hydroxide it is and gives 4 OH minus and liberates hydrogen gas H2 which bubbles out and therefore, thereby the 4 OH the 4 OHs which are generated here and this is actually an H OH here. So, 4 OH minus which is generated in the previous step here uh, reacts with SiOH 2 2 plus and this gives SiOH 2 2 minus and H 2 O and if you just uh, write the overall reactions. So, these 3 reactions taking place kind of parallelly if you react the or if you write the overall reaction by summing over the left and right sides and thus the electrons and some other species get cancelled you are left with Si plus 2 OH minus uh, from the hydroxide plus the carrier H 2 O the fluid uh, the water which is around which would give SiOH 2 uh, plus 2 and this is actually in dissolved state ok. So, this dissolves very fast it is an ion which dissolves fast in the solution and it liberates 2 H 2 O. So, therefore, the silicon is really removed as SiOH 2 uh, plus 2 state inside the solution it is a complex which is formulated inside the solution. And uh, problem is that in the steps of reaction overall 4 electrons are transferred from each silicon atom into the conduction band ok. But uh, if you look at uh, the, the etching processes really it is then a function of uh, the presence or absence of the electrons. Now, manipulating the availability of electrons can make uh, controllable etch stop possible and that is happening because uh, in its crystalline structure silicon atoms in 1 1 1 planes of stronger binding forces and it makes uh, the electrons to really uh, lose their valence band configuration and get into that outer conduction band. Uh, and, uh, and thus their availability the readily or their ready availability is kind of very very difficult ok. So, thus uh, the H rates at 1 1 1 planes are the slowest possible H rates and considering that to happen really eventually the sides of the particular channel get shaped towards the 1 1 1 direction because that is the slowest removal rate or the slowest H rate. So, the basic silicon H and some of which uh, provide the hydroxide groups are uh, alkali hydroxides like NaOH, KOH, CSOH, rubidium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide etcetera. Uh, then there are these uh, ammonium hydroxide based etchants one of the very popular um, HS that are used are TMH based it is called tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide or simply ammonium hydroxide based etching. So, anything which can furnish hydroxyl ions easily and then you have uh, this uh, other uh, mixtures which can again give hydroxides one of them is uh, EDP, uh, ethylene diamine, pyrocatechol or a mixture of ethylene diamine, uh, pyrocatechol and water which can give hydroxide ions readily. Um, EDP of course, is hazardous and uh, this causes cancer. So, they it is not a very environmentally friendly process and uh, wherever there is EDP performed and it is not very often used also because of this one factor. Uh, you have to have uh, proper safety measures to use it. Other uh, agents could include hydrazine water com complex or uh, amine gallate agents etcetera, uh, which can also uh, just identically release electrons um, or release hydroxyl ions uh, to initiate this redox process. Let us look uh, into what the really the anisotropic etchant shape would be and what is the comparison with the isotropic process. As you can see here some of the SEM images of anisotropic versus isotropic etches 
this right here as you see is a spherical etch where etching takes place uniformly across all the directions. This is blown up by about 300 times using a mag, uh, uh, an electric field of about uh, close to 0 0.8 kilo volts and this right here is 33 microns which means that this would be a couple of uh, 100 microns let us say about at least uh, 600 microns or so along the, uh, the etch window and the depth again could be close to about 500 microns or about 400 microns or so. This right here again is done at about 20 kV and uh, essentially uh, this is kind of an identically shaped uh, corresponding an isotropic HNT used process. So, you can see that eventually um, the, the shape which formulates is dictated by the 100 plane ok oh, sorry the 111 plane which is in this case the least electron releasing plane or electron donator. So, so therefore, it is an auto shaping technique of silicon uh, the anisotropic etching process. Let us now try to understand this process a little more mathematically a little more closely. So, we have uh, a case where let us say a micro channel is etched in a 100 wafer with a KOH solution ok uh, the, uh, the potassium hydroxide solution and we have to determine the angle between the channel walls and the front surface uh, what really this angle would be ok. So, we are talking about this particular angle theta that we need to detect here and uh, then we also uh, are given that the top channel width and etch rates are respectively 100 microns and 1 micron per minute uh, and uh, we need to find out what would be eventually the bottom channel width after about 20 minutes of etching process is over. And uh, in the third uh, question we have to find out how long uh, that process takes place till it stops uh, as both the planes meet essentially because you know uh, the, the 111 plane as you know is the slowest etching uh, step that you have. And so, eventually when you are going at a certain angle it is almost always obvious to assume that they would kind of meet each other when uh, there is an abundance of no other planes, but the 111 plane. And so, therefore, the etch rate will kind of slow down almost become negligibly small 0 in that kind of a situation. So, we need to find out how much time it will take to arrive at that kind of a situation. So, let us solve this problem uh, one by one. So, based on the crystal structure the angle between the fast etching plane 100 and the slow uh, etching plane 111. Uh, can be represented here as you can see by the angle alpha ok. So, alpha is the angle which is between the 100 plane uh, and the 111 plane 111 plane of course, being this one this is the 111 plane the triangle is the 111 plane and this is the 100 plane ok. Uh, so, the angle is really the angle between these two planes as can is, is accurately represented here by this angle alpha all right alpha is this angle between these two uh, vertices or whatever you can call. Let us try to determine this. So, based on the crystal structure the angle between the fast etching plane 100 zero zero and the slow etching plane 111 is the angle A B C ok this is B this is A this is C let us call it alpha. So, how do you find it? So, let us say in triangle D A E this is D and this is E vortex. So, let us say we ha have to see what is essentially the characteristic feature of uh, this A B um, which is also a, a kind of um, median of the triangle D A E. So, in triangle D A E with the, the angle d a e really equal to 90 degrees. If you look at uh, the angle here this uh, angle 
D A E is 90 degrees ok, D A is this one ok. So, it is like uh, basically the two, two coordinates x and y uh, perpendicular to or orthogonal to each other. So, uh, so basically the, the height in this case uh, a b. So, let us just draw this triangle out here ok. So, you have a triangle both mind you these both are 1. So, this is root 2 and uh, this is 90 degrees and essentially you are doing uh, this in a manner that uh, this is. So, this is basically a kind of uh, isosceles triangle with this angle equal to this angle equal to 45. So, this would uh, the median would uh, be actually a perpendicular line. Uh, which is actually equal to. So, you look at this particular triangle now which this is root 2 by 2 ok this is 1. So, naturally the other uh, part here would be root 2 by 2 ok. So, really a b this is b a b is root 2 by 2. So, the height a b here is root 2 by 2 alright. Similarly, in triangle a b c this this followed by this which is the uh, 0 1 0 direction basically. So, you have another case here which is very interesting. So, let us say you take this triangle off here and draw it you have uh, one side which is uh, 2 root 2 2 by root 2 root 2 by 2 and other side which is 1 ok and uh, essentially the angle uh, between this side and this side is alpha right that is what uh, this is about. So, I am actually taking this inclined triangle taking this inclined triangle and trying to flatten it up like this. So, that is what it is going to be. So, you have root 2 you have 1 you have uh, sorry you have root 2 by 2 you have an al angle alpha and you have 1 here. So, naturally if this is 90 degrees because this is going to be 90 degrees in any case the, the side B C is essentially root 3 by 2 ok. So, the side is root 3 by 2 and I am not really worried about that what I am worried about is what this alpha is. So, alpha essentially can be given by so tan alpha is in this case 1 by root 2 by 2 or it is root 2 or alpha is actually equal to tan inverse of root 2 and root 2 is 1.414. So, the tan inverse of that is essentially equal to 54.74 degrees it is more than uh, 45 degrees tan 45 is 1 ok. So, therefore, uh, the alpha value the angle here is 54.74 degrees. Now, uh, we know that after 20 minutes So, the first part is answered. So, first part is basically what is the angle of the plane finally formulating. So, the angle of the plane finally formulating in this anisotropic etching process with the, uh, the direction of the face of the wafer is really 54.74 degrees this alpha here this is the face direction of the wafer this is the angle of the plane. So, this is also the 1 1 1 direction alpha is 54.74 degrees and uh, let us find out what happens after 20 minutes. So, after 20 minutes of etching with an etch rate of uh, 1 micrometer per minute the channel depth d is really uh, nothing but you know it is like uh, uh, 20 times of 1 micrometer per minute which is actually the h rate which is given the vertical h rate which is given. So, it is about 20 microns all right. So, if it is about 20 microns then uh, the bottom channel. So, basically you want to find out what is the bottom channel width. So, let us draw this figure again. So, you have uh, a case here where uh, this angle right here and here is 54 point 74 degrees and this distance which has been etched off or etched away is 20 microns 
so therefore, uh, the bottom width here W B and this is actually the top width okay, W T uh, which is equal to the bottom width W T minus 2 times of D by tan alpha. Okay. That is what exactly the W B is the bottom width is. So, W T minus 2 by D by tan alpha and uh, essentially uh, the top width as you know uh, W T is nothing but uh, it is equal to about um, close to uh, you know 100 microns as has been suggested uh, by the question itself that the, uh, the top window the ch top channel width is about 100 microns. Now, uh, so if that is so, we have the bottom width here is 2 uh, times of d by tan alpha, d is the h depth, h depth is about uh, close to 20 micrometers and uh, tan alpha is essentially again uh, root 1 by root 2 as we know. Um, so, it is essentially uh, nothing but uh, uh, 1 by uh, tan alpha is root 2 I am sorry. So, uh, tan alpha is about root 2. So, essentially this uh, whole thing boils down to uh, let me just rub this and rewrite it again root 2. So, this whole thing boils down to 100 minus root 2 times of 20 microns uh, which is actually equal to 71.7 micrometers. That is exactly what uh, W B or the bottom width is in this particular case. Okay. So, if the etching process stops so, the etching process would stop again as and when the bottom width W B is 0 as you can see here all right. So, here what happened is uh, this was the top width W T this was uh, the bottom width. So, W T minus 2 times of D by tan alpha. So, this is D this essentially is d by tan alpha. So, you are actually uh, subtracting both ends to d by tan alpha in the process okay, from W t. So, here if W b is 0 then uh, the, the maximum h depth that would be needed for uh, uh, the, the W b to be equal to 0 is essentially equal to uh, d max is W t by 2 tan alpha okay. and uh, in this particular case as you see here uh, W t by 2 tan alpha would be actually equal to about 70.7 micrometers. And uh, time t again would be equal to d max by 1 micrometer per minute which is the h rate. So, it is about 70.71 minutes. So, that is what essentially the uh, the time until the h stop is achieved uh, would be. So, it goes all the way to about 70.71 minutes uh, which is also corresponding to 70.71 microns uh, where uh, the bottom width W b uh, becomes equal to 0. So, now I hope you are kind of uh, aware of this whole etching business and the way that an isotropic etches can be accomplished. So, I would now like to move on to uh, the dry etching processes which is yeah, by using plasma uh, techniques okay. and essentially dry etching, uh, etching as you know is again um, a process where material is selectively removed uh, by an agent which may be in the liquid or in the gaseous uh, state. Okay. So, here uh, the dry etching can be categorized as uh, physical dry etching okay, uh, or chemical dry etching primarily. Uh, physical dry etching as you know it utilizes beams of high energy ions, electrons or pho photons, photons whenever lasers are involved, electrons whenever E B machining is involved. Uh, so, this is essentially to bombard the material surface. Okay, and uh, the kinetic energy of the ions knocks out the atom from the substrate surface in that particular case. So, high energy beams really uh, then tend to kind of evaporate uh, metal atoms uh, from uh, the knocked out materials 
and uh, the basic mechanism is ablation. The basic me mechanism of material removal is material ablation. So there are some limitations in this uh, high energy physical etching, physical dry etching process. Now the major limitations are the slow etch rates because you have to individually uh, ensure that uh, you know all the atoms and all these uh, uh, molecules are knocked off uh, and vaporized completely from their solid bounds to a state where their mean distance goes at least 10 times more uh, than the uh, you know the, the distance of uh, solid state or liquid state okay. So low selectivity is also one of the major problems with this particular uh, process because you know uh, the ions attack uh, essentially all the material surface which is available. It does not distinguish between uh, material uh, which is covered versus material which is uh, exposed okay. Uh, it is an ionic uh, uh, kind of you know uh, beam which you are falling on the material. So, wherever it would hit the material it would immediately start attacking the metal uh, or material selective uh, non selectively. So, there is nothing called edge stop until you reduce the beam power to 0. The essentially the edge stop is when the beam power falls down to 0 it is only controlled by beam power. So, there are other problems or issues one of the major limitations is what we call trench effects which are caused by reflected ions. So, you have ions sp spotting into a let us say you have this is the spot where this high energy beam uh, is being focused of this particular ion okay. And uh, you have sputters of material all around and this causes the trench effects which means that some of the ions heating away from this uh, sputter actually start heating onto the edges and edges develop these trenches like features which is very very common to this kind of physical dry etching. The other kind of technique is chemical dry etching where you have actually a, a gas. Uh, which is an etchant gas which chemically removes away uh, the material okay. So, you have uh, essentially uh, a chemical dry etching uh, reaction between the substrate surface and the gas uh, that you are supplying. So, gaseous products are conditions for chemical dry etching because uh, deposition of reaction products will stop uh, the etching process okay. Uh, and uh, and basically chemical dry etching is also completely isotropic in nature and the technique is similar to uh, other wet etching forms exhibits relatively high selectivity because again uh, because it is a chemical removal process uh, the chemistry uh, is actually the determining factor. So, if you make a different chemistry which is unsuitable to etching it can act as a etch stop layer very accurately well, that is what dry etching is about. Let us actually see how this dry etching process can happen like for example, in case of uh, silicon atoms if you hit fluorine inside a silicon matrix uh, it starts immediately forming silicon fluoride this is SiF2 which has been formulated still it is unbound there is another fluorine addition which happens and then finally another and so this SiF4 essentially is a gas phase material okay. So, it is a gas phase material which would kind of, kind of leave the surface also you have to see that you have uh, satisfied all the bonds associated with silicon. So, the unsatisfied silicon is kind of left bound in the lattice structure and the silicon here which was initially there because of unsatisfied bonds now have been satisfied by fluorine and it leaves away as an independent entity or a gas. So, therefore, wherever silicon goes off as SiF4 uh, you have trenches or you know vias which are created and it is essentially a. Uh, chemical dry etching process as a reaction is happening there is a gas phase which is sending in and there is a dissolved gas phase of silicon which is coming out essentially of the process. So, some of the recipes of dry etching gases uh, are like for example, for material silicon with a selectivity to SiO2 you have these different boron uh, trichloride chlorine, boron trichloride uh, carbon tetrafluoride, boron trichloride uh, methyl tri trifluoromethane, trifluoromethane uh, you have uh, chlorine and CF4 uh, so on so forth uh, and, and so therefore if you have to remove material SiO2 uh, you know it is selective to Si or aluminum layers these are some of the gases which are used and so on so forth. So, this table basically is a kind of complete recipe of dry ash and gases available for thin films uh, functional materials uh, which can either use uh, chemical or physical processes to remove off the material okay. So, another uh, uh, very interesting um, kind of dry etching process is a physical chemical it is a combination of a physical as well as a chemical dry etching okay. 
So, uh, these really are called reactive ion etches uh, or reactive ion etching process and uh, it depends on the pressure zone in which uh, a plasma has to be created over a surface. So, essentially there is a chemical gas phase reaction which is responsible for etching, but it is done within a plasma atmosphere where there are ions and electrons of this gas and there is a certain drive pressure or an ionic momentum which is imparted to these species. It can drive into a substrate and start removing material from the substrate. So, so therefore, uh, based on this uh, RIE processes, there are different kind of uh, sub processes like anodic plasma etching, magnetically enhanced reactive ion etching, MERI, triode reactive ion etching, TRI and transmission coupled plasma etching TCPE. So, there are different kind of reactive ion etching processes uh, that one may think of in the physical chemical etching area. Uh, some of the other important processes which are used are chemical vapor deposition reactors uh, where these uh, chemical uh, etching can be carried out. So, typically you have a substrate as you can see here and you have uh, a set of heaters uh, which would be able to heat the substrate to a certain temperature. You have an inflowing reactant and a gas inlet and a byproduct gas outlet. The heaters are actually on both sides so that you can uniformly heat the substrate and then definitely uh, this is actually what a horizontal reactor would look like typically and then you flow in flow out the gases uh, which would cause the reaction on this substrate and there would be a gas state which is dissolved and the gas finally goes out from this outlet end. Similarly, um, in case of uh, a vertical composition of the reactor what happens is that you have a gas inlet which is thrown into this area where there is a reflecting plate and the ions are reflected off and removes the material and this is highly heated zone with this resistant set of heaters and then therefore, whatever is removed here is or whatever is produced here is again removed by the exhaust system continuously. So, there is a flow between the reactant and the gas inlet. So, there is going to be sufficient amount of laminarity or turbulence which is introduced by the various uh, flow velocities that are achieved within this particular kind of vertical reactor. So, you have a horizontal reactor and you have a vertical type of reactor for chemical uh, vapor deposition processes. So, this slide here illustrates uh, uh, how you can etch cantilevers and diaphragms using wet etching techniques uh, and I have I think illustrated this before, but I would just like to go through it once more. So, you have uh, let us say a P double plus etch stop on the top of a silicon and you are actually opening a small window here on a sacrificial material masking layer uh, which is made in this black here. And through this window you etch using an isotropic wet etching so that you formulate on both sides 54 degrees angle of the walls. Uh, so, you typically put a hydroxide etch and then you are left with this P plus membrane here which is only a few nanometers and it is like a vertical membrane or it is a simply supported beam or a membrane which can be used for various purposes. If you could have used instead of uh, an isotropic isotropic wet etching with slight amount of stirring then the etch would have been spherical in nature and therefore, you can actually get again the same formulation of uh, a thin membrane on the top of this, uh, this semi spherical kind of structure which is used uh, or generated by isotropic etch. You would like to, uh, so this is how a diaphragm could be manufactured. If you on the other hand want to manufacture a cantilever the best way to do that is to put a sacrificial layer as you are seeing here on the top of silicon and then you cover it with a polysilicon or an active layer uh, by some deposition mechanism thereby removing this material back. So, that you are left with a freestanding membrane structure over silicon. You could use another masking alternately to remove the material from this end. So, you have a perfectly um, you know kind of separated cantilever structure for different uh, diagnostic studies. Now, I would like to come to the next process which is uh, photolithography. Okay, so, therefore, uh, we are kind of towards the end of this lecture, we will try to introduce some more processes like photolithography and uh, other deposition techniques like sputtering or ion implantation in the next lecture. Okay, thank you.